Jesus was a Jew, not a Christian. This single historical fact opens the door to understanding Jesus as he really was in his own time and place. It's a door that many have never thought to enter. Jesus was circumcised, observed Passover, read the Bible in Hebrew, and kept Saturday as the Sabbath day. 2,000 years of relatively hostile separation and alienation between Judaism and Christianity has tended to obscure the fact that Jesus grew up in a religious and cultural world that had been almost wholly lost to the subsequent developments of Christianity. To understand Jesus in his own time and place, we have to understand his deep commitment to the ancestral faith of his fathers. He saw himself as doing nothing other than fulfilling the words of Moses and the prophets and the messianic hope that guided his life and led him to his death. This was the central core of his innermost being. In one sense, this book is about the religion of Jesus the Jew. That is, what he believed, how he lived, his vision of God's will in the world, and what led to his execution by the Romans. I want to try to shed light on what we can know about Jesus growing up as a Jew in first century Galilee. So the question arises just how Jewish was Jesus? And given the varieties of Judaism in his time, what kind of a Jew was Jesus? One tendency among scholars of the last century, now largely discarded, was the attempt to strip him and his message of its Jewish context. The idea was that Jesus, though born a Jew, realized the deficiencies of his obsolete ancestral faith and moved beyond it into a type of universalism. Jesus, according to this view, proclaimed the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of humankind with a set of universal ethics that superseded the legalistic ways of Judaism. Judaism is seen in this view as a fossilized precursor of the final revelation that Jesus brought to the world. We now understand that such views have no historical basis and in fact are subtle manifestations of Christian anti-Semitism. Yet they've become deeply etched into our Western cultural consciousness. To be a Jew in first century Roman-occupied Palestine had as much to do with national and ethnic identity as with abstract religious beliefs. To put it another way, for many Jews, it was impossible to separate the social and political realities of military occupation and economic oppression from Jewish piety and faith. The Jewish belief that the people of Israel had been chosen by God to become a model nation that would exemplify justice and righteousness to the entire world was fundamental. The Hebrew prophets had predicted that in the last days all nations would go up to Jerusalem to learn about the one true creator God, irresistibly drawn by Israel's moral example of peace and justice. Not all Jews accepted such an idealistic vision, but enough did that John the Baptizer, Jesus, and his brother James were able to spark a movement that threatened the highest levels of the political and religious establishment. Jesus' family, like all Galilean Jews, would have made the pilgrimage trek south to Jerusalem as required by the Torah three times a year, every year in the spring at Passover, in the early summer for the Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot, and in the fall for the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot. At Passover in particular, Josephus, the Jewish historian, claims that as many as two and a half million Jews from Palestine and all over the world gathered in Jerusalem. It was there that Jesus regularly encountered the most poignant symbols of Roman power, fused with what he considered the epitome of Jewish religious corruption. Herodian Jerusalem, with its palaces, theater, hippodrome, 
luxurious mansions and magnificent temple might be viewed as a wonder of the world by many, but to Jesus and thousands of others it was a den of thieves soon to come under God's judgment. It is no accident that Jesus at age 33 deliberately chose Jerusalem at Passover as the setting for his dramatic confrontation with what he called, quote, the powers of darkness, unquote. We have to imagine that his perceptions are deeply rooted in his experiences growing up. Sepphoris and Jerusalem, the two chief representations of Roman oppression and religious corruption, one in the north in the Galilee where he grew up, and the other the capital city of Judea, were absolutely fundamental to how he viewed his calling and his destiny. Jesus grew up poor in a rural Jewish town in Galilee. The region was dotted with hundreds of such towns and villages populated by extended clans and family groups who farmed the adjacent land. The houses were modest, made of field stones packed with mud and straw. The floors were beaten dirt, windows were few, and the roofs were thatched reeds laid over wooden beams and covered with mud to form a flat rooftop area that was utilized year-round for sleeping, eating, and domestic chores. Houses often had underground chambers used for storage. Furniture was sparse and pottery was local and practical, almost wholly undecorated and unadorned. Absent were mosaics, imported ceramics, fine glassware, gold and silver coins, cosmetics, jewelry, and bronze vessels. All these are common in the urban areas of Sepphoris and Jerusalem. The larger houses might have a courtyard in several rooms with extended families living together. These houses often expanded into a haphazard network of shared structures. Livestock lived in enclosures attached to the houses or in dugout areas in caves, and small gardens were cultivated wherever space allowed. Staples were olives, bread, and lentils. Eggs, milk, cheese, salted fish, meat, fruits, and vegetables were welcome additions. Skeletal remains show evidence of dietary deficiencies and death from disease before age 40 was not uncommon. We can get a sense of things as they were in that time by visiting the Nazareth Village Archaeology Project in the modern city of Nazareth. But much is missing. The noise, the stench, the crowding, the grime and grit of daily peasant life, the feeling of living under military occupation, and of course, Herod's virtual army of ever-watchful inspectors, agents, and tax collectors. The center of civic and religious life in a Jewish village was the synagogue. Gatherings were held on the Sabbath day when the normal work activities of the whole town came to an abrupt halt from Friday at sunset until dusk on Saturday. Precious handwritten copies of the Torah or Jewish law and the books of the prophets were read aloud and discussed. As Jesus grew up, how much he spoke and how much he listened in these adult gatherings we have no way of knowing. But from an early age, he must have begun to absorb the variety of ideas and conflicting opinions that were expressed. The range of topics was endless. What activities were forbidden and allowed on the Sabbath? Should you pay taxes? How is the Jewish calendar to be determined? By the cycles of the moon or the sun or both? Were none, some, or all of the dead to be raised at the end of the age? For what cause could you divorce your wife? Was the kingdom of God to manifest itself in a literal way on earth, or only after death in the heavenly world? Jews were a people of the book, and as the Romans were to learn, that made them different from any other people over whom they ruled. Judaism can be summed up under four rubrics, God, Torah, land, and chosen people. As a Jew, Jesus would have affirmed his belief in the one creator God, Yahweh, above all other gods or spiritual entities. The divine revelation of the Torah as a blueprint for social, moral, and religious life. The holiness of the land of Israel as a perpetual birthright to the nation and the notion that the people of Israel, 
descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have been chosen by God to enlighten all nations. As a Jew, Jesus was circumcised at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem at eight days old. He observed the Sabbath as a weekly day of rest. He avoided eating certain forbidden animals or consuming blood. He celebrated the required pilgrim festivals, and he practiced ritual purity as commanded in the Torah. As a Jewish male, Jesus wore the fringed tassels on his outer garment, which indicates his strict observance of the mitzvot, or commandments of the Torah, or Jewish law. In that sense, he was not liberal with regard to Jewish observances in any modern sense of the term. What he did not accept were certain oral traditions and interpretations that some rabbinic teachers had added to the biblical commandments. There is a sense in which Judaism is both exclusive and universal. There is substantial evidence that significant numbers of non-Jews were attracted to Judaism and even attended synagogues throughout the Roman world. To do this, it was not required that one formally convert and become Jewish, although that could be done. Gentiles who turned from idols to the true and living God and observed the prohibitions against stealing, murder, and sexual immorality, were considered righteous Gentiles or God-fearers. It is safe to assume that the tiny village of Nazareth had few, if any, Gentile residents, though in nearby Sepphoris one might daily rub shoulders with non-Jews. Jesus appears to have been accommodating toward outsiders, and we might assume that this had come from his experience growing up. He was neither provincial nor separatist in his attitudes. He seemed to detest the Roman establishment and its Jewish collaborators, while at the same time welcoming individuals whom he judged to be spiritually worthy. If his biological father was Roman or became Roman, that might further explain his openness. When he returned home as an adult, having achieved some reputation through his activities of preaching and healing, the townsfolk on the whole seemed to have scoffed at the idea that Jesus had some special prophetic role. His honorable Davidic pedigree through his mother was likely disparaged by the locals who knew the stories of his illegitimate birth, not to mention his lack of economic status as a tecton. Beyond these general observations regarding village life in a town such as Nazareth, is there anything more we might be able to say in trying to address the question of what kind of a Jew Jesus was? Was he a card-carrying member of any of the Jewish groups of his day? Josephus, our contemporary first-century Jewish witness, tells us that there were three main sects or philosophies of Judaism, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. At one point, he explains there was a fourth philosophy founded by Judas the Galilean, followed by the so-called zealots, but he says that in their religious views, they were much like the Pharisees. The Sadducees were mostly drawn from the priestly classes. The high priest, endorsed by Roman political appointment, was chosen from their ranks. Accordingly, they exercised the main control of the Jerusalem temple that was the primary focal point of Judaism worldwide, and they held sway over the Sanhedrin, a type of Jewish council or senate that the Romans allowed a certain limited rule. The Sadducean interpretation of the Jewish law tended to be stricter and more rigid than that of the Pharisees, and their concentration on this world rather than a world to come contributed to their skepticism about subjects related to the heavenly world whether angels, demons, resurrection of the dead, or events associated with the end of the age. The Pharisees, on the other hand, freely indulged in speculations about such matters. Their interpretation of the Jewish law was more liberal and accommodating to change. Although there was a more rigidly conservative wing of the Pharisees, the first century Rabbi Hillel seemed to have the greater influence. Rabbi Hillel and Jesus both emphasized love of neighbor as primary and quoted the golden rule as a thumbnail summary of the Torah and the prophets. 
But in the end, it was a coalition of Sadducean priests and their supporters among the Pharisees who delivered Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. In contrast to his brief sketch of Pharisees and Sadducees, Josephus devoted many pages to an elaborate and detailed description of the Essenes, with whom he was evidently sympathetic. The Essenes, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, expected the end of the world and were waiting the coming of two messiahs, a priestly figure and a Davidic king. They were intensely anti-Roman and detested the Jewish religious establishment in Jerusalem, whether Pharisee or Sadducee, as hopelessly compromised and corrupt. Jesus shared some important beliefs and practices with the Essenes, but judging from the Dead Sea Scrolls, he would have been roundly condemned and despised by their core leadership for his open attitude toward Gentiles and women and his stance on Sabbath observance and ritual purity, which was considerably less strict. Judaism in first century Roman Palestine was incredibly diverse. The problem with Josephus's categories is that one might get the impression that most Jews were somehow formally affiliated with one of these main groups. It is easy for us to think of them as akin to modern religious denominations like Baptist or Catholic or Reformed Judaism. We know such is not the case. Estimates of the Jewish population of Palestine range from one to three million. Josephus tells us that there were only 6,000 Pharisees and 3,000 Essenes. They represent broad categories of religious thought or philosophy that only a handful of the elite or learned might take on as formal labels. The movement Jesus eventually forged had attractions for those who identified with any of these philosophies of Judaism. Jesus' younger brother was known as Simon the Zealot, He became part of the inner council of twelve apostles, and in the end the Romans crucified Jesus for sedition, his claim to be the rightful king of the Jews. As such, he joins a cast of zealot types from Judas the Galilean to Bar Kokhba, a final messiah the Romans crushed in 135 AD. Jesus is best identified with what might be described as the messianic movement of first century Palestine. It was intensely apocalyptic, and though sharing certain ideas with the Essenes, it had a much broader appeal to rank-and-file Jews of all persuasions, united in their hope for God's deliverance. Jesus did not originate this movement. It began to take shape 200 years before he was even born. But it was Jesus, his kinsman John the Baptizer, and his brother James, who gave it the definitive shape that changed the course of history. At some point before age 30, Jesus began to formulate his plan. There were doubtless stages along the way, but in the fall of the year 26 AD, Jesus was ready to go public and the Jesus dynasty began to emerge.